At the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, if it's on our shelves, it's history. It's interesting that you mentioned, uh, let's, let's go to the soldier for a moment, and how the soldiers themselves had a role in advancing medical knowledge because they had knowledge themselves. They had been educated a bit themselves. This is the first war, really, that we have all these letters back, you know, that, that the soldiers could write home. Crimean War had a little bit of that, but this really was the first time that an educated soldiery was writing and discussing things. Uh, the grammar might be poor, but nonetheless, they got their thoughts across. But just saying that they also were able to help the physician by explaining what they were feeling inside themselves. Yeah, um, in chapter four, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to look at the development of medical specialization, which um, is really, it, it, it's very new and it's not a fully formed professional category until much later <laughs> into the 70s. But what you have now is a new body of knowledge. Um, and it's and in, in this case, I looked at clinical neurology and heart disease. And Silas Ware Mitchell and William Williams Keene and George Morehouse actually sit down with their patients to try to ascertain. They're looking at reflex paralysis. DaCosta's looking at heart disease. But these patients are living and they have symptoms that are not well understood or have even been seen by physicians before. And so they ask, the patient tell me everything that you're feeling they perform tests with uh, elect the what's called the electric test to look at muscular contraction and things like that and they write they take thousands and thousands of pages of notes based on patient complaints and it really becomes the very first body of literature that we have about clinical neurology um, Charles Brown Sicard from Paris comes and gives a lecture to physicians in 1864 at the Smithsonian, and he talks about reflex paralysis and also tetanus. And they're actually, he's, he's fascinated by the work that's going on at Turner's Lane Hospital in Philadelphia. So they're using the, talking to the patients. And, 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 and in this particular case, it was crucial for the development of the specialty because they didn't know, they hadn't seen these types of cases before. And these soldiers bought into, you say, uh, the medical knowledge they were helping, sure take my arm and use it. And uh, they bought into using their own bodies for medical knowledge they felt, and the public did too, that there was something to come out of all of this carnage, that something good might happen to help soldiers down the road and other people as well. And uh, you mentioned one private in here that uh, went to the Army uh, Museum and uh, to visit his arm. Yeah. And uh, he... Some wanted them back, I understand, as well. Well, I found that source early on, and I thought, oh, you know, I'll delve into Foucault, and this is going to be all about ownership of bodies. And I really didn't find a lot of stories about soldiers demanding their body parts back, but what I did find a lot of were, were numerous letters saying, would you mind photographing my, my body part and mailing me that photograph? It would be a very valuable war relic to me. And um, so having their body station maybe in the National Pathological Cabinet, um, you know, was, was there was maybe some sense of pride with that. But I thought there might have been more uh, resistance. Um, but I think once the leg or arm was going to go. But it, that's actually uh, revolutionary because prior to the Civil War, there is at least 17 anatomy riots right up until the almost the eve of the Civil War into the 50s. By the end of the Civil War, you have a national pathological cabinet with with the, the body parts of American soldiers that's not hidden. It was it was not hidden. It, not, it was widely open to the public. It was co sort of considered one of the sites to see in Washington, and Congress was funding it. Congress was funding this research. So it had changed from dissection of bodies to being some sort of morbid curiosity to really being a part of, like it is today, a, modern modern medical study and you need to have that access to bodies for medical students. Did, how did photography help this? Uh, I know I can tell you that TV certainly brought Vietnam home to me and others over dinner and wow it also changed us uh, about that war and how we felt about it. How did photography help the medical sciences and for the public to understand what it is. Here you can see an, a limb off and a suture. And 
how how many photographs do you do you, besides being in Harper's or Leslie's and they show some of the bodies, and of course the medical and surgical after the war that really show a wide range of suturing and diseases and everything pathology. Uh, how do you what do you see in the collecting world? I'm kind of interested out there in the. Are there many photographs that were actually they're, disseminated and purchased? They're, they're getting rarer, and they're, they but are were they out there at the time? We owe that to Dr. Bontecue. Bontecue was the first surgeon, federal surgeon. He worked mm -hmm. at Harewood Hospital, and he started taking pictures of the war wounded. And these were disseminated into the, the, the museum, and people could see, uh, or physicians could see a gangrenous wound, what it looks like, how the sloughing of the tissue and things like that. And during the war, this was the first war, and I guided Antietam. I always tell my people out there that uh, this is the first battle that was actually photographed. Uh, Brady sent Gardner and his, his people there within two days, and they were taking pictures of mutilated, bloated bodies and sending them back to New York to the parlor, and the people would spend 25 cents to come and see the horrors of war. So what did this do to them? I mean, it, watching TV s sent us against war and, and helped get us out of Vietnam. I don't know if this well, really they're, they're, helped end the war, but what did it do to the public? For the photographs, there is a there is an important political dimension to these photographs because, as Gordon said, Dr. Uh, Bonacu, Reed Bonacu, sent in numerous photographs. A, a few other physicians did too. They were labeled contributed photographs, but the Army Medical Museum themselves hired two photographers. So that it, at first it was for pension requests. Soldiers might go there. In some cases, it was to continue the treatment that had started with the war. Say, for example, a specialty. Um, but these photographs were bound into volumes. They were displayed at the International Medical Congresses, um, at the Army Medical Museum, and there was a new recognition of the new scientific uh, supremacy of the orthodox physician. These were, this is some of the medical cases that we had. These are what we're doing, and it's far beyond the realm of your understanding, but we can, we can understand it. And so they would use some of the photographs and, and case histories to um, compel Congress to continue funding the museum. In other words, don't just end it when the war's over, because the war's over, but let us continue to develop this as a national center of medical research and study. So in this case, the physicians used not just the photos, but their, their war record of knowledge to compel further support for this enterprise, which and, continued. And was this a Surgeon General's office that was really pushing this and then after the war that the government got involved in, in helping out? This was, it was the Surgeon General but it was also, um, and maybe surprisingly so, physicians at, at medical societies, particularly in the Northeast, in, in Boston, Philadelphia, Washington of course, because there was this recognition of the importance of, of the medical museum for the you know continued development of these medical sciences. and. Many of the case reports are still coming in after the war. And so when we see these first major discoveries in the Spanish-American War with uh, Walter Reed and George Miller Sternberg, it's not necessarily just the influence of, of Germany or Johns Hopkins. They're actually building on this tradition of research that we see developed through the medical museum. Um, so it was important to, to physicians that this continue. And they would write widely and say, we have 275,000 treaties, we have specimens, we have photographs, we have, so come to our museum and this is a center of learning for all physicians, even the South. Even the South. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, going, I'm showing a letter here that you we just got that. in. Please don't show it. I'm showing this letter <laughs> from May of 62 uh, by the uncle of Jonathan Letterman, uh, whom you know well. Uh, and figures in your book as well. One of the things that it figures, and this particular letter also has an endorsement on the back by one Abraham Lincoln, uh, sending it back to Stanton uh, to do with Letterman what he wants. He wasn't recommending or not, just saying, you know better, I've read it, is what he's saying basically. And Stanton saw the efficacy of Letterman and put him in and, uh, into the army quickly. He was one who really helped with the Ambulance Corps. I was fascinated to read about, both of you have read, uh, talked about the Ambulance Corps. Uh, Silas Weir Mitchell, um, after the war, uh, or maybe I think it was, late boasted that the Ambulance Service uh, 
boasted of the ambulance service. And that was really Letterman doing much of that, was it not? Yes, he had... Uh, he and saw, what were the innovations that he put in? Well, the innovation was he took the uh, e evacuation of wounded out of the quartermaster corps mm -hmm. and put it under direct co uh, coordination with the medical director and the corps medical... And they had a separate ambulance system and they had their own commissioned officers and their only job in battle was to remove the wounded comfortably and get them out of the battle area and it was set up in a systematic area. Did this happen at all during in the south? Did yes they, they had but they didn't have the, the equipment mm -hmm. that they had uh, but it Letterman only had it in the Army of the Potomac and that was uh, signed off by McClellan in 1862. The, the birthday of the ambulance system in our country is August 2, 1862 <clears throat> and McClellan signed off on it and saw uh, what it could do for the morale of the soldiers. You know, if you're wounded on the battlefield, the worst thing you can do is you're gonna, you think you're going to be left there. Sure. But if you have a system, systematic care where the people are, their only job is to get you off of that battlefield and get you to a hospital environment where you can be taken care of, you're going to feel better about it. So Letterman worked on this system and worked on it and worked on it. And finally, in, it, uh, I'm just doing a lecture Saturday on the evolution of the evacuation system from Antietam to Gettysburg mm -hmm. and how it evolved from Antietam to Fredericksburg to Chancellorsville to, to Gettysburg and how it worked. And I, uh, you know, I, I brought up Vietnam and that comes into mind again how well that they could evacuate and I think a soldier felt some comfort in that. World War Two was that as well done? World War One? I'm not so sure. World either. War One was. Uh, the equipment was bad. They had carts, horse-grown carts. They had a few trucks and things like was that. Was it still under the medical yeah. department? Yeah, yeah. They still under they the stayed there from then. Yeah, on. and in World in World War Two, they started getting better at it. Mm -hmm. Korea was the first time they used helicopters mm -hmm. to remove wounded out of that battle area. Mm -hmm. And then in Vietnam, in, in Vietnam, 20 minutes, they were getting casualties off of a landing zone and into a hospital zone. Uh, and now in Afghanistan, you get a, a patient and you get them to a field dressing hospital, they're going to live because within seven, eight hours, they're out of that theater and they're in Germany hmm. with these air ambulances that they're using over there. And that all started with Jonathan Letterman. It's still called the Letterman Plan. It is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I'm going to put the two of you to work for a moment. If you'll please sign these for our people who are uh, asking for them. And I'm going to thank some of you uh, who have uh, ordered books before. Arthur in Amisville, Virginia, Rob in Providence, Utah, Jeffrey in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, Frank in Carroll Stream, Illinois, uh, Sherilyn in Tacoma, Washington, uh, Gary in Toronto, Ontario, uh, who is in our audience yeah. today. You could have uh, just done it here. Uh, the Smith family in Longwood, Florida, as always, we thank you. Charles in Scottsdale, Arizona, Mark in Madison, North Carolina, Dan in Downers Grove, Illinois, Les in Chicago, Letterman, Silas, Mitchell, but Hammond is another one that had a lot to uh, do with this war, and we didn't really get into him, but he's in this book uh, a great deal. Reconstructive he's surgery. He's my hero. <laughs> uh, and the experimental method, which is prominent in your book, on how the experimental method was taken over. Not that I'm, a I'm asking this, did European physicians, you know, we're, we're, we heard about how Americans went over to learn and brought over some of that knowledge here. Well, did the European physicians didn't have a war on the scale to use. Uh, did they start to come over here to learn? There were um, quite a few that came over here to learn, but more interestingly, um, when I went into the Army Medical Museum to do my research and I looked at the big letter books, in developing Civil War medicine and some of these ideas about medicine, um, some of the American physicians, notably Woodward, at the museum and through the museum, wrote numerous letters to very prestigious uh, European physician, Rudolf Virchow, um, R. L. Maddox in developing photomicrographic standards. And there is such an important influence from these elite European physicians, um, but now on American soil. And there's and through this sort of interaction, there's a recognition among some of the top doctors in Europe 
about um, the new standards in American medicine that developed through the war. So they, these letters are, are fascinating. And by the end of my book, um, I sort of try to take you on a journey from 60 to through to uh, the cholera epidemics of 66 and 67 and 73. Um, when they have all these international medical congresses on cholera, they uh, are now incorporating the American experience and some of the management strategies developed through the war. Before the war, a lot.